here and thanks for listening to the adulting is easy podcast where we make adulting easier by making money easier this is your host lauren and i'm joined today by devin Kennard, a nine-year nfl veteran real estate investor and author of the new book it all adds up designing your game plan for financial success he's purchased 28 properties in his personal rental portfolio as well as invested in over 30 real estate syndications across the country thanks for joining me devin thanks for having me it's a pleasure I'm looking forward to it, but I do also want to let listeners know about another way to invest in real estate. And many of the listeners want to invest in real estate, but it's not really easy for three reasons. One, usually requires a lot of upfront cash. Second, it's complicated. And third, it lacks liquidity. This is where Fintor comes in. Fintor is a next generation real estate app that solves these problems. With Fintor, you can start investing in real estate with less than 50 bucks in a matter of minutes. You even have the ability to sell your shares in the future to other Fintor users. It's like the stock market, but for real estate. As today's show sponsor, Fintor is offering Adulting is Easy listeners a free share. Support this podcast by downloading the free Fintor app and use the referral code at Adulting is Easy to get that free share. And there's a link in the show notes. Our goal for today is to make adulting easier for everybody by discussing a personal finance topic since managing money is a big part of adulting. So today, Devin, we're going to talk about real estate. But before we get to that, can you tell us about your book? Yes. So my book, um, It All Adds Up, it, it's a book that I've been super passionate about. And I think, you know, being an African-American and a professional athlete, there's not a lot of people in my position talking about finances, talking about financial freedom. And I, I've seen the American dream as we've known it and been taught it uh, fail so many people. And I just wanted to shed light on, you know, the right way to look at, look at finances and how to kind of create the new American dream for yourself, which I think is very individualized in, in uh, today's world. And it's not, you know, the cookie cutter work for 60 years, um, you know, ret retire, live off 401k and social security. That's, that's failing people left and right. And there's, there's alternative ways to look at finances. And, you know, that's what I discussed throughout my entire book. So please uh, make sure you go and order it. Uh, it's everywhere. So check it out. Congrats on writing a book. That's not easy. So huge congratulations to you on that. Yeah, uh, it was, it was a lot. And a lot of it I wrote during football season. So it was challenging, you know, I, did a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time on it on, on our off days. And then look at night before I went to bed, um, working on it and, and going back and forth with editors, but it, it's a fun process and I'm glad uh, to kind of get it to the finish line. Yeah. That, that must feel incredible. So can you talk a little more, just since you brought up the schedule, what is life like during the season for you guys? Really? Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty much six to six for most days throughout the, throughout, um, throughout the week. I mean, our real work day starts on like Wednesday and you got to wake up early and you got meetings and practice all day. We have to lift, uh, you know, we have to study the game plan, have meetings on different parts of the game. People don't realize we break kind of football up into, you know, downs. Like, so some days we're working on first down or third down or red zone. So we have different emphasis every day and, uh, you know, there's 70 or so uh, plays in a game and the amount of time we put in for those 70 plays is immense. Um, and, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of time and effort and kind of, kind of poops as the week goes on, but as uh, Saturday is our travel day. So whether it's a home game or a away game, but our, our toughest days are Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, usually we have Mondays off and then Tuesdays is complete meetings. So it's, it's work, you know, people, people don't realize that it's, you know, it's not like we're just, Oh, go practice for a couple of hours and then go home and do whatever you want to do. It's a, uh, you know, it's a big time commitment. I, I would say we're putting 50, 60 hours in a week and, um, you know, on top of actually playing on Sundays and, and spending a lot of time away from our family. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And so Somehow you're slotting in writing a book and communicating with editors in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You gotta, uh, I've, I've learned you gotta be very disciplined with your time and the whole time blocking and, and being able to be focused. That's, that's been a huge component on me being able to build a real estate portfolio as well as write my book. Right. So in the NFL, you're surrounded, I mean, nine years, you've met tons of players. I mean, some of them have to be some of the richest people there are. Is that right? I, I would assume. Uh, some guys, some of the pay paychecks are, are huge, but what a lot of people don't realize or at least don't think about is you literally have to cut our salaries in half. Um, we're W-2 earners, so we're taxed in the tax bracket. 
So, you know, for instance, I play in Arizona and my tax rate was 44% the last few years. Um, and, and then agent fees are 3%. So that's 47% right there. So if you're in states like New York or some of the places with even higher state tax, you're literally cutting it in half. And then also uh, for all the real estate investors out there, you like you see a contract and it's black and white. Like if you say a property is a million dollars, it's a million dollars. Uh, football contracts are not like that. So you see on Sports Center a ticker that says so and so signed for ten million dollars. All you need to be paying attention to is what, the amount that's guaranteed, because um, only the guaranteed money really matters. Most of the time, I would say, probably over fifty percent of the time, guys don't see their full contracts um, and, and what that is. So when when you kind of w really dwindle it down, so a guy signs. A ten million dollar contract. Well, that's already really only five, but then six of it's guaranteed. So that's what he's really only going to see. So six, and you cut that in half, and that's three. And all of a sudden, you know, all right, three million is a lot of money, but it's not ten million dollars. Not what you saw come across the the ticker on uh, Sports Center. So I think I think uh, people realizing that it kind of opens a lot of eyes to where it's like there's people there's players making a ton of money uh you know salary caps going up guys are making a ton of money but overall it's not nearly as much as people think right and those gigantic contracts tens of millions of dollars that's really a such a small percentage of players too right yeah you're talking about the very like top top guys that are making usually quarterbacks making a crazy amount and the top five to ten guys at certain positions making you know substantial money but there are far more players signing for um you know less than two million dollars and i'm not saying that that's not a lot of money but it's not what you're seeing and what they're promoting on you know sports center espn etc so i think people real uh, getting an idea to realize like that is that is a small percentage of the the whole NFL and all the players who are making, you know, 20, 30, 40, hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of dollars. I mean, it, it's not everybody. Right. And I think what people may not think about, let's say they're earning one hundred thousand dollars. That's what they can earn if they wanted to until they're 70 or whatever. Right. You guys don't have that. It's not like you're going to make a million dollars from now until you're 65 if you want to, because your careers, I mean, nine years that's got to be way above average, right? I mean, geez. Yeah, the average NFL career is three and a half years. But yeah. um, even with that, the salary-wise, I, I get frustrated when people say, how do, how do NFL players go broke? They made so much money. Most people who grow that much wealth they do it over time and they and 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 you know really accumulate it with business acumen or you know within their job investing. You're talking about people who focus on one thing, playing football, and then one day they snap their fingers and they're good enough and you put millions of dollars in their pocket. Just because they're good enough to play football to earn that money doesn't mean they know what to do with it once they have it. And um, you know, that that therein lies the problem because you make a ton of money. And then you think it's going to last longer than it does, um, than it does. Are you, are you kind of projecting like, oh, I'm going to get a bigger deal the next time. So you're spending all your money, injuries happen or things don't go your way. And, and, you know, you easily start to dwindle that down pretty quickly. And, you know, you're creating a lifestyle for yourself that's hard to sustain. I'm in sales. And so I definitely have known a lot of salespeople that have sort of spent their commission checks before they've gotten them. And I think it's probably like that with even some of the guaranteed money versus the, you know, the full contract, maybe some people assume they're going to get the full contract, or like you said, they assume they're going to, after their rookie contract, get some big one and maybe they don't. So that that's interesting. Do people, do you guys talk about money or like, do you guys, is there any sort of financial conversation happening in the NFL? It's, it's evolving, you know, being in the uh, NFL almost a decade now, I would say it was kind of whispers in the locker room when I got in. And now there's more conversations about it, but there's a difference between guys starting to know that they should invest or know all these different, you know, from stocks to, to Bitcoin to real estate, all this stuff. But there's a difference between kind of knowing about it and actually taking action and doing it and knowing how to build a portfolio, knowing what to look for. And uh, a lot of people are afraid to lose their money. So if you're a guy who doesn't come from much and you make come into millions of dollars, you're, you don't want to lose it. So you're the, the natural thing is to hold on to it real, but you're not factoring in inflation. You're not factoring in, if you're not spending it on investments, you're slowly, slowly spending it down on other things. Like, and th but there's this thing of like you kind of want to hold that money hostage or you don't know who to trust 
And it's all about, you know, education because with education comes comfort. And when you're educated enough, you get comfortable with the certain decisions. And that's what I found in, in how I've been able to grow into real estate. With education comes comfort. Love it. Yeah. So stocks, Bitcoin, why real estate? Why'd you go that route? For me, um, when I first got into the NFL, I was walk, looking around in the, in the locker room and everybody was talking about stocks and this financial advisor and getting, you know, and, and all that. And it was all, it was all stock market based. And I felt like it wasn't solving the issue. So I was immediately um, kind of intrigued on like, how am I going to get out of, how am I going to solve what I feel like the problem is cash flow? Like I need income. I don't know how long I'm going to play and I want to develop income that can sustain my life. And I didn't think that the stock market was a solution. So, uh, and I started to look at real estate and talk to real estate professionals. And I'm like, so it can appreciate like the stock market can, you know, like, oh, the value goes up. But while it's doing that, I can get income and I get tax benefits and I can, I can use leverage. And there's such thing as good leverage. And I started to like learn and, you know, it, it was I, um, the generic ways I started out rich dad, poor dad, bigger pockets, and just kept growing and learning and networking and building building teams around myself and, and having conversations to get more and more comfortable. And um, as I started to do that, just taking baby steps day by day, month by month, year by year, and you grow more and more comfortable. And I would say to everybody out there is like, learn as much as you can, but eventually you got to shoot your shot. And, and take action. And my first property was an $86,000 property in Beach Grove, Indiana. And I did it with a partner and we each put 12,000 down because I said $12,000, I'd hate to lose, but I can manage um, after my you know rookie season in the NFL. I can manage if I lose 12. And that got the ball rolling and you know um, really kind of set the bar for, okay, I really can do this. I can grow this. Let me, let me dive in more. So I, I highly recommend that everyone learn as much as you can and then shoot your shot. You were thinking about real estate in your rookie year. Yeah, really going in. And it, it's because of my college experience. Like um, I was the, I was the top five recruited recruit out of high school. I go to USC, which is the top football program in the country. And I just start having issue after issue injuries coaching changes, position changes to where it looked like my professional career was going to be bleak. And I started to figure out what I wanted to do outside of there. And I met a um, real estate investor who graduated from USC and he was a police officer turned real estate professional. And he built in a massive portfolio, owned thousands of units, uh, managed over 6,000. And we're talking in LA. And I just remember telling myself if he could do that, starting off of a police officer salary, then like I can take whatever money I make in the NFL, even if I only play one year and I got a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. That's a huge jump start into you know what I want to do. So I, I kind of had the idea that I wanted to do real estate, and um, it, it just kind of re reinforced once I got into the locker room and and started started seeing the kind of culture and the environment. And I'm like, man, this is really not going to last forever. I need to kind of start now. Yeah. And you did. That's awesome. Okay. $86,000 with a partner used leverage. Was that a single family home? Yeah. Single family home. We we're you still at the end, like four or $500 sure. split it in half. And like I made a good return on it. I, at the end we sold it and I, we sold it. Um, and we each pocketed over 25 grand, I think 27 to be exact. So, and, and that's not including cash flow along the way. So it was a great investment that, uh, that amount of money wasn't you know, didn't do a whole lot for me at that time, but you know, my return on investment was huge. And that was just like, what if I did this and I own a hundred units one day, or, you know, now I own 28, like, you know, as, as I start to scale the economy of scale, this, you know, $27 pay $27,000 payout once I sold well, was nice, but you times that by 20 properties. Okay. Now, now we're talking. So that, that kind of really got the ball rolling. Right. I said this recently that that first deal, a lot of it is about learning and running the numbers, seeing it really, really in real life and then extrapolating it out and being like, all right, if yeah. I get more efficient, if I get better at this, or if I start getting maybe some multifamily units, I can really get more efficient with this. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you own real estate? So my first property was in Beach Grove, Indiana, and I learned a valuable lesson. Invest where you can scale. Um, I didn't have 
the infrastructure to keep buying the the guy I was buying turnkey properties at the time and that's how I kind of made my hay early early on which I think is a great path for people that are as busy I just told you what my football schedule was so I didn't want to deal with a lot so th that was my route but the turnkey provider I used in Indiana kind of started ghosting us um he I think he had some other big time investors that were buying up most of this stuff and just wasn't replying to emails text calls so uh, we were stuck with one property and that's why we ultimately ended up selling so then I went to uh, Cleveland Ohio Kansas City and um, so I, I now I own in Cleveland, um, Kansas City, Tennessee, and I'm focused out in your market in Tampa right now. And, you know, that's where I kind of plan on scaling for the foreseeable future. So what do you mean that you couldn't scale in an area? I understand your turnkey provider wasn't returning calls, but you also talked on Twitter sometimes about like the team that you need in those areas. Yeah. So essentially I couldn't scale because I didn't have a team out there that I that I trusted. Uh, I was very reliant on this turnkey provider and. Um, he was he was essentially even though he I don't know if he was an agent or a broker but he was my deal flow so if I don't have deal flow it, it, you know the buck the buck in so that's like the most important piece is can I get good deals because if you can get really good deals then I found the rest are domino effects because if you can get good deals whoever you're getting good deals for from is going to have recommendations for a good contractor a good property manager I like to get at least two of each so I can kind of interview them, fill, fill them out, et cetera. So, but once I once I was running out of deal flow um, or I didn't have any deal flow there, that's kind of, it kind of ended, ended um, you know, my opportunity in Indiana. Looking at it hindsight, I might, maybe could have dug in deep and tried to find wholesalers and all that. But again, I wanted turnkey properties. So, um, you know, finding someone who was doing that at a high level, renovating them properly, giving me a fair price. I just, uh, you know, I wasn't comfortable once, once he kind of, fell off and, and disappeared on me. So it was like, all right, I have to go elsewhere. So the, that was a single family home. Your first one, are you still doing single family homes? Are you doing small multis, big multis? What do you, what is your I'm mix like? Small, small multifamily now. I, um, I'm not afraid of a single family if it makes a lot of sense, but just I'm able to scale faster. And the whole, I used to be against the whole like, oh, it's just as easy to do a four unit as a one, but it actually is. Um, it's, it's not, not more difficult. So I'm, I'm kind of focused. I'd rather do small and multifamily. I bought my first six flex recently, have several duplexes I've done in the last uh, couple of years. So I would say my focus is there, but if a, if a single family comes, that's really just hit it out, um, hit it out the park. I, I, I'm not afraid to knock that down either. How are you? Fi are you financing them? Are you paying cash? Are you still doing partnerships? What does all that look like? Yeah, I, st I stopped doing partnerships after the first deal. Cause I, I was just like, all right, I, um, I, that was my first one after my rookie season. Then I started making more money and I'm like, all right, I can do the same deal, get double the profit. I don't need a partner. And I started out buying buying cash, these turnkey properties, because I wanted, like in my head, I was like, I got to get to ten to $15,000 of cash flow. So if I buy these properties cash, while well, I have this influx of cash, I'm going to be able to get that rapidly. Let's say, you know, each unit was about $1,000 of rent. So you start to do the math, uh, you know, I get to 10 to 15 properties and, and a thousand dollar rent. I'm, I'm pretty much there and right in my ballpark of where I, where I want to be after expenses. So that was my mindset, but now it's, it, you know, I'm open to all things. I've done a lot of portfolio lending. I have some 30 year fixed regular mortgages and I still buy cash right now. The deal has to really be make a lot of sense, and if it does, I'll buy cash. But my cash is valuable, so it has to be. I need I need to be you know winning in multiple ways. So I need to be buying below market. I need to be cash flowing at at least eight and a half percent is kind of my my floor, and um, it needs to be forced appreciation where I can grow it even more. So um, you know if I can if I can hit those three things right now, then I'll pay cash because it's like okay yeah. I got to pay cash and I'm putting a lot of money into this property, but I'm instantly getting into equity and it's going to cash flow great. And I'm able to force appreciation and bump up the, the equity even more. So, you know, once I can get those deals, I'm, I'm pulling the trigger and I'll worry about financing down the road. But if a deal does pencil out with financing, I, I, I prefer financing. But a lot of the things I'm seeing just aren't, um, isn't penciling out well enough for me with, with a ton of leverage. Well, yeah, the, with the interest rates the way they are right now, that, that totally makes sense. And that that's what you're talking about when you say a portfolio loan too. You could pay cash for stuff now and finance it later. 
and use, yeah. use that that's, kind of reuse the money. Exactly. So that's, that's really like my mindset. If interest rates go down low, or if I start to get really good deal flow and a killer deal comes, I'm going to leverage, leverage my portfolio, whether it's refinance, whether it's a line of credit, um, you know, but just be in a position where I could be nimble and make moves as opportunities present themselves. Yep. That, that makes, that makes sense. So why do you have syndications too? I'm asking this question a little bit selfishly because I think that might be something I want to do to bring some more passive income into my life. Well, I, I would say syndications are a great thing because you don't have to do all the legwork. It, like only thing at risk is the capital you invested. When you're buying real estate on your own, you're handling everything A to Z, A to Z even with a team like you're like you got to get the loan you got, like it's it's all on you and in a, in a syndication whatever money you invested but if you vet the syndicator correctly and I hate that there's so many terms you can call them a syndicator a general partner a sponsor they have all these names all the same thing the people running the deal vet them and the deal and essentially you're just getting updates from there, whether it's quarterly, monthly, you know, whatever. And, and that's the same with the preferred return. So I, I, I only do deals with a preferred return of at least 8%. And uh, most of the deals I'm in have a 70, 30 split when, so when the deal either refinances or um, sells the limited partners, which I would be considered, um, you know, get 70% of the growth and the general partners get 30%. So, why people don't like them is they feel like the general partners are the ones that are really winning because, um, you know, they're investing some of their money, but they're putting the sweat equity. And if there's only like five general partners and there's 20 limited partners, they're splitting their 30% between five. So they're getting a big return, but it's the price to not have to do anything. So I make sure I have kind of a, a stringent kind of criteria of like what fees are too high um, how successful are they as syndicators and stuff. But I'm like, to be completely passive and generate that kind of um, income yearly um, is is great. And you get to participate in the upside in a major way. So I've, I've made my hay. I've done more syndications than I have personally because I have access to a lot of synd uh, syndicated deals. And my mindset is as I retire and those deals like kind of go full cycle, I can start to funnel that money into my own stuff. So it's not like one or the other. I leverage them both and they and they feed into each other. That that's I love that. And that's the thing that I think some people get wrapped around the axle when it comes to real estate. They're like, I need to do single families or I need to do duplexes or I need to do this or I need to do that. You can do a mix of things, which I think sometimes people forget about. Now, there's something to being an expert in certain areas, but you can also branch out and try different things. You know, well, and I, and I kind of focus in. So how I look at it is I don't want to give myself a job. I've worked my whole life to play in the National Football League, done it my whole life. I want to kind of live life on my terms. So I want to invest in real estate and I look at passive ways to invest it. And I think passive is kind of a very taboo word because people sometimes people take it in like it doesn't mean you do nothing. Like even in my syndications, I'm underwriting the deals and the people running the deals and doing my due diligence, making sure it makes sense. I'm checking on, checking on things, making sure I'm getting my, um, you know, dividend payments and getting updates. So, but it's that to me, that's passive because that's minimal work. Like that's, that takes a couple of hours, not even on syndication side uh, to, to handle. And then on my personal portfolio side, same thing. I want to kind of focus on the things that I value and that's building relationships and underwriting the deals. If I can do that and have two people I'm working with that are handling everything else, then that's passive to me. So, um, you know, when I look, when I look at it like that, it's like, all right, I'm not just focused on building my own portfolio because I am a passive real estate investor. What are the main ways I can invest passively and let me be an expert in passively investing in real estate. And, um, you know, that's, that's how I kind of got, got into those. And then most recently into lending, which I think is an incredible, uh, tool that people can use for extra cash flow as well. Yeah. Lending is interesting. It's something we did, uh, we did seller financing of our six unit. So, you know, someone is lending to us, which is, which is interesting and fascinating. And, that's something that I may want to do in the future. I talked to my husband about, it. I was like, what if we sell or finance this to somebody later? And then they do all the work and then I get the cash flow from it. And it could be also helping an investor out. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's a great opportunity from both sides. You know, it's it benefits because I charge high interest on on my on my loans, but the thing is, I can move fast. Like right. I kind of know what to expect in the contract. I have my lawyer look over it. You have your lawyer draw it up. We can come to terms, and and you can get get your money fast and not have to deal with a lot of the hoops that the that the bank has to deal with. So if you're looking for that in the short term, that is a great solution for a lot for a lot of people. And it's it's a great business model because the collateral is typically the actual property and our personal guarantee. And I usually like a combination of both. So I want to know, you know, can you pay me back personally um, with your equity in this property and our other properties, cash, whatever. And is your stake in the property enough to, you know, pay me back as well? And if, and if both is the case, I think you're taking a lot of risk off the table, especially when you're dealing with someone who knows what they're doing and is, you know, an, a sophisticated investor that just wants to scale or wants more, um, you know, revenue. So I think it's great. And and with the seller financing, I'm I'm hoping to do a seller financing deal because that would, uh, that would be amazing. So you're gonna have to tell me a little about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Th- it was, it was awesome. You know, just older guys and you know, you're looking in Florida right now, there are, there's an insurance situation, right? So, you know, the, the, our apartment building that we bought, it requires flood insurance. If you go through a lender, which makes it really expensive. Our, the guy that lent to us didn't require flood insurance. We ended up getting it anyways, but that's something that if that flood insurance becomes more and more of a problem over time, even though it's 16 feet up, that would be something that we would be able to allow people to maybe skip, skip out right. on. So I think with the way insurance is, I think we're going to see more seller financing deals and self-insuring. And that's a whole, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so what are your investing goals then? When are you going to retire? And when are you going to start, you know, maybe cycling some more of that syndication into some, some more deals? Yeah. I mean, um, with the NFL, I want to play another year or two, but I'm, I'm in a position where I can, I can make, uh, it has to be on my terms. I, I want to make a certain amount of money and I leverage myself outside of the game of football to be in a position where I have the power of choice. So I feel blessed to be in that um, circumstance because many players play as long as they can because they have to. I want to keep playing because I want to. And I love the game of football. I'm passionate about it. But I have two young daughters at home and, you know, I'm building enough momentum off the field to where I don't feel like I don't feel the pressure like I have to go do this. So, you know, if the right opportunity and the right dollar amount comes, I'm absolutely going to keep playing. But I'm also, you know, very ready and I feel um, in a good position to take off in real estate and, and with my book and the other things I have going on, which I think everyone could take note of is like people talk about plan a and plan b and burn the bridges only have plan a um and i'm like since when does plan a only have to be one thing um for me plan a has always been football but i knew football was going to end so as soon as football started i was planning for this and now i'm in a position where i'm able to keep playing football but on my terms so um i think more people in day-to-day jobs w-2 jobs out there they should have the same same mindset and like you know, you, you could love your job, hatred, it doesn't really matter, but build towards next thing, build other revenue streams, build wealth um, that's going to benefit you now and in the future. And, you know, taking that perspective. So that that's where I'm at. And um, as deals kind of close for me, when, when you mentioned syndications in my personal portfolio, uh, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm always buying and always evaluating deals. So I'm going to keep growing my portfolio. Uh, a big um, kind of goal for me is league minimum in the NFL is $1.2 million. So um, I'm aggressively, intelligently and aggressively um, trying to get to the point where I'm generating that and more through my real estate portfolio. Cause then I can say I'm making football money and I'm not hitting anymore. So uh, (laughs) that's, that's a, that's a big goal of mine. In, in all transparency, it's probably more of an ego thing. I don't need to get that for financial freedom and stuff, but it, for that exact reason, just to be able to say like, you know, at this point in my career, i would sign a deal for about that and to get to the point where I'm generating that in passive um, passive income uh, would be, you know, a huge deal. So I'm that's what I'm working towards. And when, when I get there, I'm, I'll, uh, you know, have to hop back on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good, I think we kind of all have that. I mean, I don't, I don't make that, right? I make like, 
between 100 and 150, but that, that was what my goal was too, right? Was to replace yeah. that. And now that I have, I'm like, all right, I guess I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Got to set new goals. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think that's the cool thing. Cause I told you early on in my NFL career, my goal was to get 10 to 15. Thousand yeah. dollars, yep. and even now, if I'm saying I want to hit 1.2, that's essentially a hundred thousand. Like, right? yep. so like I don't, I don't have to hit that, and you know, but that that's like kind of my far-reaching next next big goal. Just because you know, once you get to that 10 to 15, I don't, I don't necessarily want to stop, and I like growing my portfolio and and finding great deals. So you know, what's what's next? Yeah, as long as you like it, keep doing it. I think my favorite part of this whole thing is you are a professional athlete who is side hustling. And I think that's freaking awesome. And I think everybody <laughs> should feel good about that. <laughs> absolutely, so do you, absolutely. do you have to be a professional athlete? Do you have to make at least $1.2 million per year to invest in real estate? Absolutely not. I, and that's what I think a lot of people need to realize is like, it, it, uh, you can do everything that I did and I have done. It just looks a little differently. Like, because I played in the NFL, I was able to buy, like, when I started buying in Ohio, I bought three homes um, all within, like, a year span. Um, three homes and then another set of three. So I bought six within, like, a year. You might buy one or two. It's like, but the concept's the same. It's, you know, it's the same thing. And, you know, because I'm a professional athlete, I had uh, um, capital. But with the capital, if you're smart with your finances, like, man, the power of what one house can turn into two and then two and the four and, and kind of um, co the compound effect is real. And my big thing is when people try to write me off, because I, when I have some of these conversations, it's like, oh, it's easy for you to say because you're a professional athlete. And it's like, I got motivated to get into this from a guy who was a police officer. And and he built and he owns thousands of homes and, and has a property management business managing all uh, 6,000 homes or more now. So it's like, it, it, that doesn't matter. I mean, it, it helps me. I'm able to scale faster because I have that revenue, but you can do the same thing. Start with one home and, you know, turn it into two to four and just keep scaling. Yeah. It starts with one property, no matter who you are. Yep. Absolutely. So is there anything else you want to add, Devin, before we wrap up? Um, just, you know, you can follow me on all my social media at Devon Kennard, uh, follow me everywhere, reach out and, uh, just hope everyone out there can reach financial freedom. And I think it starts with having the mindset of this is what I want to do. I think everybody should and could in, th in this day and age, uh, build passive income streams outside of their day job. Uh, you've done an amazing job and you've been a great follow on Twitter. Thanks for inviting me into the real estate Twitter world. So, um, uh, I'm just, you know, excited to be in the community and make sure you uh, follow me on all my social media. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. And where can they get your book? DevonKennard.com? Is that right? Yeah. So you can go to my website at Devon Kennard, uh, www.devonkennard.com or, um, you know, Amazon. It's everywhere you can buy a book, uh, buy a book. I, I listen to mostly audio books, so you can buy the audio version. That's that's out. So um, anywhere that you would buy a book, go, go buy. And I hope it's one of those books that really kind of opens a lot of minds and changes perspectives and helps people reach financial freedom. Everybody, you can follow me on Twitter at adulting is easy on Instagram at adulting is easy real um, on YouTube as well at adulting is easy. There'll be some clips from this conversation there. If you want to go over there, uh, email me at real adulting is easy at gmail.com. If you like this episode you may also like episode 139 pro soccer player opens first STR or episode 83 buying seven rental properties in two years. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Hopefully Devon and I made adulting a little easier for you. Thank you.